Israel is at war. The kids around me, they're just kids. Why wouldn't you just send a missile to them? Israel will finish it. Israel has admitted they've created something so advanced that it will destroy Hamas. This came after Hamas started the Al-Aqsa flood operation, which led to a conflict that has killed over 2,500 people in just six days. Israel is retaliating and has promised that things will only get worse for Hamas. But what exactly is Israel planning to do, and does Hamas stand a chance? Join us as we look at the most recent developments in the Israel-Hamas war, where we'll look at how Hamas initiated the operation and how Israel has chosen to retaliate. Number 1. A Message from Benjamin Netanyahu On the morning of October 7th, a conflict erupted as Gaza released over 3,000 rockets upon Israel. Simultaneously, about 2,500 Palestinian militants breached the Gaza-Israel border, launching attacks on the military and nearby Israeli communities. The loss of life was devastating. The attack claimed the lives of 1,400 Israelis, including 260 individuals attending a music festival. The aftermath saw surviving civilians and Israeli soldiers captured and held captive in Gaza, including women and children. The consequences inflicted upon the Palestinian-controlled region rendered approximately 250,000 people homeless. Displaced individuals sought refuge in streets and schools, desperately trying to find solace. Within a single day, Israel officially declared war against Hamas. In response to this declaration, Israelis formed a unity government. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, and former Defense Minister Benny Gantz led this newly established body. Gadi Eisenkot and Ron Dermer assumed observer roles within the war cabinet. Together, they made a pledge to prioritize the unity of the Israeli people and emphasize their shared destiny during these challenging times. During a late-night televised address, Netanyahu delivered a stern message, vowing to crush and destroy Hamas in the aftermath of their assault. He labeled every member of Hamas as a dead man. Public pressure mounted, demanding urgent action to address the situation. The Israeli government recognized the need for swift action. Setting aside political differences, Israeli leadership pledged to work collaboratively to safeguard the nation. Netanyahu stressed that the fate of the state hung in the balance. Defense Minister Gallant drew a parallel, declaring their intent to obliterate Hamas, likening it to the Islamic State group ISIS. Their determination was resolute. Hamas will meet its end. Throughout the war, Netanyahu recounted the events that unfolded during the Hamas attack. His account included reports of bound individuals, shootings, burnings, rape, and beheadings. While independent verification of some of these claims was yet to be established, testimonies from rescue workers and witnesses corroborated most of these incidents. Netanyahu referred to the opposition as human animals. He shared these reports to illustrate that Israel's actions were a response to Hamas's deeds. Number 2. The Bunker Buster Strategy In the Gaza Strip, a crucial network of tunnels exists serving as a vital lifeline for sustaining the flow of essential commodities within the region. These tunnels are of great importance to the Hamas groups operating there. Reports have emerged, indicating that the Israeli military, in their mission to eradicate Hamas, has specifically targeted the tunnels located in northwestern Gaza. Employing a formidable weapon known as bunker busters, Israel seeks to cripple these underground passageways. But what exactly are these bunker busters, and how powerful are they? Bunker busters represent one of the most lethal forms of ammunition, meticulously designed to penetrate the depths of the earth before detonation. Their efficiency in obliterating fortified and buried targets is unparalleled. Broadly speaking, there are two primary types of bunker busters. The first type boasts a reinforced nose, ensuring its survival upon initial impact. This additional weight grants the bomb the momentum it requires to penetrate the ground or structures before exploding with force. The second variety consists of two charges, or bombs. The initial smaller charge acts as a gateway, creating an entry point within the target, allowing the bomb or missile to penetrate without impediment. Subsequently, the main charge detonates inside the target, resulting in substantial destruction. The origins of bunker busters can be traced back to World War II, when their initial purpose involved neutralizing subterranean German rocket factories. Over time, these munitions underwent continuous development to effectively combat fortified structures, particularly those concealed underground. 
However, one might question why Israel specifically employs these formidable weapons. Experts suggest that Israel's utilization of bunker busters in recent conflicts is part of its strategic approach to target Hamas's underground positions. During the 2014 Gaza War, Israeli forces encountered significant challenges when attempting to neutralize Hamas within the tunnels, leading to casualties among their ranks. By employing bunker busters, Israel can safely strike Hamas from a distance, mitigating risks to its own troops. Considering the complex network of tunnels possessed by Hamas, which Israeli forces would find arduous to navigate, the utilization of these munitions is expected to persist. This approach allows Israel to continue its operations without getting entangled within the intricate labyrinth of tunnels, an environment where Hamas possesses intimate familiarity. Number 3. Israel's Immediate Retaliation Slowly but surely, Israel has been increasing the intensity of its attacks on Hamas. Just two days following Hamas's attack, the Israeli Defense Forces initiated strikes on approximately 500 locations in the Gaza Strip. The densely populated Jabalia refugee camp was among those areas affected, resulting in numerous casualties, including innocent children. The IDF declared their complete control over Israeli towns near the Gaza perimeter fence, while ongoing operations against militants persisted in Stero. Responding with a firm warning, Hamas threatened the execution of Israeli hostages if Israel persisted in striking civilian homes without prior notice. In response, Israel's defense minister announced a comprehensive blockade of the Gaza Strip, intending to sever electricity and restrict the entry of vital supplies such as food and fuel. Human Rights Watch was strongly against this decision, condemning it as abhorrent and urging the International Criminal Court to take immediate action against this potential war crime. In answer to that, the IDF decided to undertake the evacuation of 15 communities surrounding the Gaza Strip. Across Europe, the Israeli Air Force deployed a fleet of heavy transport planes. These aircraft were utilized to gather hundreds of off-duty IDF personnel, who would then be dispatched to engage in the conflict. While this unfolded, Hamas released another wave of rockets, targeting Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. They managed to damage a terminal at Ben Gurion Airport, only heightening the sense of urgency within Israelis. Number 4. Some Control Regained By October 10, Israeli forces successfully regained control of Kfar Aza, a community that had endured the aftermath of the conflict for three days. The scenes they encountered in the area included mutilated victims, beheaded women and infants, and homes engulfed in flames. An estimated 100 or more innocent civilians, including 40 infants and young children, fell victim to the violence. In response to the situation, the IDF started a mobilization effort calling upon over 300,000 reservists. Airstrikes were launched strategically at key locations in Gaza, including the al Daraj and al Furqan neighborhoods, as well as the vital port of Gaza. The strikes had a significant impact on Gaza City's al Karama and Ramal neighborhoods, which housed important institutions such as government ministries, universities, media organizations, and aid agencies, worsening the crisis. Israeli warplanes also targeted the Rafah border crossing, a crucial link connecting Gaza and Egypt. Additionally, the family residence of Mohammed Daif, the supreme military commander of al Qassam brigades in Khan Yunus, faced devastating airstrikes, resulting in the loss of his father, brother, and at least two other relatives. Simultaneously, within Israel, the government enforced measures to bolster security. National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gvir announced the acquisition of 10,000 rifles to arm civilian security teams. This step aimed to protect border communities, mixed Jewish-Arab cities, and West Bank settlements. An additional 4,000 assault rifles, helmets, and bulletproof vests had already been procured from a domestic manufacturer and were ready for immediate deployment. Amidst these circumstances, Hamas militants were determined in their actions. Another incursion occurred, this time targeting an industrial zone in Ashkelon. In the ensuing clashes with the IDF, at least three militants lost their lives. Rockets continued to rain down on Tel Aviv and Ashkelon, stressing the ongoing hardships faced by the affected regions. Number 5. The Violence Gets Worse On October 11, in a series of targeted strikes, Israeli warplanes demolished multiple buildings that belonged to the Islamic University of Gaza. The reason for these strikes was the alleged transformation of these structures into a weapons factory and training facility. Hamas, in continuation of its rocket attacks, focused on Ashkelon this time. These rocket strikes came with significant consequences. 
even leading the UK Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, to seek cover while visiting the town of Ofakim. In Storo, one individual sustained several injuries, and four buildings suffered damage following a rocket attack. An Israeli airstrike resulted in the loss of four paramedics associated with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. They were inside an ambulance at the time of the strike. Amidst these unfolding events, the Gaza Strip encountered an acute energy crisis. The sole power plant in Gaza depleted its fuel supply, and all sources of gas and other fuels were cut off due to the blockade imposed by Israel and Egypt over the region. Video evidence emerged on the same day, raising suspicions that Israel might have utilized white phosphorus during an assault on Gaza's harbor. It showed two artillery shells, followed by the emission of white smoke. The use of this controversial weapon can cause substantial damage, particularly when employed in civilian populated regions. Human Rights Watch further verified videos illustrating the attack on Gaza's harbor and another occurrence near the Israel-Lebanon border, suggesting Israel's involvement with white phosphorus. Number 6. Going Large Scale In the early hours of October 12th, Israel's military initiated a large-scale strike on Hamas targets within Gaza. These airstrikes specifically targeted the elite Nukba forces, command centers, and a senior Hamas naval operative's residence, which was suspected of having unspecified weapons. It was also reported that commanders from two minor militant groups were among the casualties resulting from these airstrikes. Meanwhile, during the ongoing conflict, Stero experienced yet another rocket attack that caused injuries to four people and damaged seven houses. On the other hand, Israel continued its offensive by striking different buildings and neighborhoods. The Gaza Health Ministry reported a significant increase in casualties, with the total number surpassing 1,400, including 447 children and 248 women. Israel's Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, Israel Katz, emphasized in a statement that the blockade on Gaza would persist until the safe return of hostages abducted by Hamas. Number 7. The Evacuation Warning On October 13, to ensure the safety of communities located north of the Wadi Gaza, including Gaza City, the Israeli Defense Forces issued evacuation warnings within a 24-hour time frame, urging people to move towards the south. But the UN deemed the evacuation of northern Gaza, which would lead to the displacement of 1.1 million Palestinians, impossible and warned of extreme consequences. After that, UN facilities, including UNRWA, were instructed to relocate to Rafah. In response, the Hamas Authority for Refugee Affairs called upon residents in northern Gaza to stay in their homes and resist the warfare conducted by the occupation. Various medical organizations, such as Doctors Without Borders, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and IRC, condemned the evacuation order because of the challenges it posed in transporting critically ill patients amid dwindling medical supplies. Simultaneously, Hamas reported that at least 70 people attempting to flee south had lost their lives due to Israeli airstrikes. Later in the day, the IDF revealed that its ground forces had conducted targeted raids within Gaza, aiming to neutralize Hamas militants and locate the abducted hostages. NBC News also obtained confidential Hamas documents that revealed sinister plans to attack elementary schools and a youth center in Kafar Saad, with the intention of causing mass casualties, taking hostages, and transferring them into the Gaza Strip. These documents were provided by Israeli first responders. On October 14th, the IDF confirmed the elimination of Murad Abu Murad, the head of Hamas's aerial operations, in an overnight airstrike. They also announced a six-hour window for refugees to travel south along specific routes within the Gaza Strip. At 5.30 p.m., an explosion occurred along one of the designated safe routes, claiming the lives of 70 individuals, primarily women, children, and an infant. The cause of the explosion remains unclear, with some sources attributing it to an IDF airstrike. Number 8. The Threat of a Ground Invasion a ground offensive poses significant risks for Israel, not only due to the destruction that the people in Gaza could face, but also because of the dense population and the captivity of numerous hostages. Nevertheless, it remains a potential option for Israel, and as a precautionary measure, Israelis have deployed tank formations and armored vehicles near Gaza. The potential consequences could be devastating, with a significant loss of lives and homes. Asia Mathkor, a Canadian citizen who has been residing in Gaza since 2014, has had to relocate her two young children, aged four and two, 
five times within a week, seeking safety from the bombings. She is just one among 4,700 Canadian citizens and permanent residents in Gaza, around 700 of whom are currently seeking relocation. According to reports, there is no haven left in Gaza, as nearly every neighborhood and building has been destroyed. The threat of a ground invasion intensifies the fear that grips the residents. During an interview with journalists, one civilian admitted that there is no positive outcome in this conflict. A ground war would prove detrimental to both the civilians of Gaza and the people of Israel. Many individuals are desperately searching for missing family members and innocent civilians who were taken hostage following Hamas's attack. Since October 7th, buildings have been collapsing daily, trapping numerous people inside. Rescue workers are facing immense challenges in reaching those in need, and the morgues are overflowing, compelling families to hastily collect the remains of their loved ones. A municipal building, serving as an emergency shelter, was also struck, resulting in multiple casualties. However, the consequences extend far beyond this incident. Number 9. Out of Supplies Two prominent members of Hamas's political office, Jawad Abu Shamala and Zakaria Abu Mamar, fell victim to an airstrike in Khan Yunus, according to a Hamas official. The Palestinian Foreign Ministry has reported the extensive damage caused by Israeli airstrikes, with over 22,600 residential units reduced to rubble, along with the destruction of 10 health facilities and 48 schools. The situation in Gaza took a further turn when it was revealed by Hamas media that the only power station had ceased functioning, leaving the entire region without electricity. Palestinians in Gaza have long relied on generators for power in their homes, offices, and hospitals, but even these generators are facing fuel shortages due to the ongoing conflict. The World Health Organization has run out of supplies that were pre-positioned for seven hospitals, unable to keep up with the overwhelming number of wounded people seeking treatment. Doctors Without Borders, the medical aid group, has also disclosed shortages in surgical equipment, antibiotics, fuel, and other essential supplies at the two hospitals they operate in Gaza. The international response to the conflict has been swift. U.S. President Joe Biden, while expressing unwavering support for Israel, has dispatched Secretary of State Antony Blinken to the region to help de-escalate tensions and prevent a wider war in the Middle East. Number 10. The Hostage Situation Throughout the 35 years of its existence, Hamas, originally an underground militant group, has used a strategy of violence to challenge Israeli authority. Despite the immense suffering endured by both sides, Hamas has steadily progressed in its relentless quest, but its recent incursion into Israel marks its most lethal move to date. Israel's response to the Hamas assault, resulting in over 1,200 casualties in Israel and numerous hostages taken into Gaza, threatens to unleash even greater devastation and loss of life upon the 2.3 million Palestinians trapped in Gaza. Hamas's decision to choose this path comes from a place of desperation. It reflects their belief that they've run out of other options and have nothing more to lose. What's adding to this desperation is the sense of abandonment by their supposed allies, particularly the Arab states. There is a likelihood that Israel will initiate a ground offensive in Gaza, potentially aiming to reoccupy the territory and completely eliminate Hamas. Such a course of action may lead to an extended brutal war. However, in a better case scenario, this approach might simply compel Hamas, which also maintains a presence in Lebanon and the West Bank, to retreat back into the shadows. There's only one thing holding Israel back. Hamas possesses a trump card. The group, along with the more radical Islamic Jihad militant organization, currently holds around 150 men, women, and children who were captured and brought into Gaza. Hamas's armed wing claims that some of them have already died as a result of Israeli attacks and has issued threats to execute the rest. In the past, Hamas has successfully negotiated the release of such hostages in exchange for thousands of Palestinian prisoners held by Israel, a deal that was perceived as triumphant by Palestinians and agonizing by Israelis. While Israel has not faced significant calls to hold back in response to the Hamas attack, the situation could evolve if the conflict persists. Hamas's recent attack is of an unprecedented scale, and Israel is expected to respond with greater force than ever before, leading to more loss than ever seen before. Ultimately, both sides may find themselves reverting to the status quo, an internationally mediated ceasefire, with Hamas retaining control over a devastated and aid-dependent Gaza while Israel strengthens its security measures along the border. 
Will Israel eradicate Hamas? Or will Hamas succeed in getting its version of victory? Let us know in the comments below and leave a like for more.